Hi everyone, my name is Peyton Camden and I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Springfield, Missouri. Today I'll be giving an overview of the total solar eclipse coming up on April 8th, 2024. If you haven't seen our previous video about eclipses, be sure to check that out first to answer any questions you may have about the science of eclipses that this video may not address. You might be watching this video because you've heard about the upcoming eclipse, or if you haven't, maybe you heard about the last total solar eclipse in August 2017, or the annular eclipse last fall. This upcoming eclipse on April 8th, 2024 has almost 32 million people within the path of totality. The path of this eclipse will span North America with totalities starting over the South Pacific Ocean and extending into the Western Mexican coast through Mexico into Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, and into Canada, ending after crossing Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. As the path crosses North America, it will narrow. This is because the moon's shadow reaches the point of greatest eclipse near Nazas, Mexico. And after this point, the distance from the Earth to the moon becomes slightly longer. While the path is narrowing, the shadow is also intercepting the Earth's surface at an increasingly sharp angle, which will lengthen the shadow along the direction of the path. Here's a figure that zooms in and centers around the Arkansas portion of the path. I can only annotate so many details, so I highly encourage looking into the portion of the path that you're interested in for more detailed information. Starting around 1.40 p.m. Central Time, the Eclipse Centerline will be moving into the Dallas, Texas area and will eventually cross into Indiana around 2 p.m. Central Time, which is 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Most places along the Centerline from Texas to Ohio can expect around four minutes of totality, with closer to two minutes of totality near the edges of the path. This slide is going towards the beginning because it's a very important part of viewing an eclipse. Your eyes need special protection when looking directly at the sun. The easiest way to protect yourself is with eclipse glasses, which have special filters made for looking directly at the sun. These are not sunglasses and sunglasses are not a suitable replacement for eclipse glasses. There are many online retailers that sell eclipse glasses, but just make sure that any glasses you use or purchase meet ISO standards. You cannot bypass using eclipse glasses by using a telescope, binoculars, or cameras either. These devices require their own special solar filters, which aren't the same as eclipse glasses due to the different viewing medium. Wearing eclipse glasses while using these devices isn't sufficient either. You need a filter on the device itself to safely use them. If eclipse glasses or solar filters aren't a feasible solution for you, but you still want to see the eclipse, you can make a pinhole projector to look at the sun shadow indirectly. One example of how to do this is punching a hole in an index card and standing with the sun at your back and projecting the sun's image onto a nearby surface. Don't look at the sun through the pinhole. Additionally, you'll still be in the sun for a few hours, so remember to follow all of the normal tips for staying safe in the sun, like wearing sunscreen, light head coverings, drinking ample water, all that good stuff. From this point forward, if I reference eclipse glasses, I'm using that as an umbrella term for any solar filters used to look safely at the sun, and we'll go over when it's safe to take those off in just a little bit. Since most people don't view solar eclipses very often, I'm gonna go through what to expect of the solar eclipse experience. The most important things that will determine your experience is where you are and the weather conditions. We'll come back to the weather part later, but to put that idea into perspective for now, even if you're in the path of totality, if there's thunderstorms in your area, your eclipse experience will be thunderstorms because you won't be able to see the sun. For the rest of this section, we'll operate under the assumption that the weather will be good for viewing the eclipse. A general timeline of what to expect is a partial eclipse with the sun gradually becoming more and more covered by the moon. After about 70 to 80 minutes, areas in the path of totality will get full coverage of the sun for three to four minutes. And after totality is over, the sun will gradually move out from behind the moon in reverse from how it was covered, which will take an additional 70 to 80 minutes. Altogether, from first contact to fourth contact, the eclipse will last two to three hours. 
The first phase of the eclipse will be marked by first contact, or when the moon first touches the sun. This is considered the beginning of the partial eclipse everywhere, even in the path of totality. This is the longest phase of the total solar eclipse at a little bit more than an hour. Your glasses should be on before first contact or whenever you first try to look at the sun. Once you get within a couple of minutes of totality, you might be able to see some unique phenomena that can only be seen with a total solar eclipse. Chronologically, the first of these phenomena are called shadow bands, which are fast moving dark bands that can be seen on the side of buildings or the ground just before or after totality. There's still a lot we don't know about shadow bands and what causes them, but it's currently theorized that they're caused by the distortion of light from the solar surface, similar to the reason why stars twinkle. These are very faint and very difficult to photograph because of the low contrast of the bands versus the ground. Around this point, the sky will begin to darken, becoming more like dusk or dawn. The shadows that you cast will start to become clear and thin, vanishing completely once the sun's light fades enough. The next phenomenon that you can see is called Bailey's beads. Bailey's beads are points of light that shine around the edge of the moon, caused by light rays from the sun streaming through the valleys along the moon's horizon. In simpler terms, these bubbles are caused by light moving through the moon's craters. So this means you're basically looking at the topography of the moon. After Bailey's beads begin, they appear to dance around, eventually fading until only a single bright spot remains along the edge of the moon's shadow. This is the diamond ring. It got its name because it resembles the diamond in a giant ring formed by the rest of the sun's atmosphere. This phenomenon is the tip off that you only have a handful of seconds before totality will begin. After the diamond ring disappears, you may be able to see the layer of the sun's atmosphere called the chromosphere, which appears as a red arc along the edge of the moon, which you can see in this image. The chromosphere is only visible during a total solar eclipse or with a sophisticated telescope, so be sure to keep an eye out for it in case it's visible to you. If you can still see light during this stage, keep those glasses on, but get ready because soon you'll experience second contact or totality. The sun will be completely covered by the moon at this point. You'll enter complete darkness during totality to the point you won't be able to see any items near you. Take a moment to observe the world around you. You'll feel temperatures drop as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the humidity, the cloud cover, and how long you're in totality. You'll also notice the winds changing directions and speeds. Birds may stop singing, which will create a very eerie feeling, and sometimes nighttime insects will come out. Once you can't see anything through your eclipse glasses, you can safely take them off. This is the only time the sun's corona, or outer atmosphere, will be visible to the naked eye, appearing as streams of wispy white light billowing out from the sun. Additionally, you could even see bright stars or planets. Make sure to check and see beforehand what the sky will look like during totality at your location, but generally you can look for Venus to the right or bottom right of the sun, and Jupiter to the left or upper left of the sun. As soon as totality ends, be sure to put your eclipse glasses back on. After totality, the phenomena that preceded it will repeat in reverse, beginning with the diamond ring. The reappearance of the diamond ring directly opposite where it was prior to second contact marks totality ending, which is third contact. After the diamond ring, you'll move through Bailey's beads again, then the shadow bands, and then back to a partial eclipse. After another 70 to 80 minutes of partiality, the eclipse will reach fourth contact and will be completely over. At this point, you can take off your glasses as long as you also stop looking at the sun. This is a pretty dense slide, but there are a lot of important considerations for planning to view a total solar eclipse. An unobstructed view of the sun through its whole path will give you the best experience in viewing an eclipse. You might be able to see the shadow coming towards you in the clouds or on the ground if you can see a long way in the direction of the oncoming shadow, which is to the southwest for this eclipse. Some say you can see a black curtain rising out of the earth to the west with hints of orange to the north and south of it. 
while the sky to the east is still relatively light. It may not be possible to see every eclipse phenomenon or even any of them because they move really fast. Your experience will be memorable whether you see them or not. However, knowing what you're looking for ahead of time gives you a better shot at seeing them. Some locations that eclipse fanatics recommend viewing an eclipse from includes locations designated by local governments for viewing parties, essentially, state parks, or other public lands. Don't set up on private property without permission, because you'll likely be around other people in these locations. Try to make everyone's experience positive by being respectful of others. Don't allow your dogs or kids to run wild or make excessive noise. Don't obstruct other people's equipment, those kinds of things. Do try not to use a flashlight or to take pictures with flash once it starts to get dark because not only will your pictures not turn out, but there might be professionals around you with proper expensive equipment that is actually able to capture the eclipse and those kinds of lights will cause their pictures to get ruined. Good photos most of the time will require very advanced equipment, so just focus on the moment unless you know you've got the proper equipment. After the fact, traffic will probably be horrible, so make sure to consider that when you're making your plans. There will be thousands of people leaving from the same areas at the same time. You might be thinking, well, that'd be cool to see, but you said seeing the eclipse is also dependent on weather. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. The basic weather background that you need to consider going into this event is that April is a transition month for the weather and is often quite variable. Thunderstorm season is starting in the south, while winter weather is still a legitimate concern further north. In the spring, the upper Midwest can see storms every three to four days, and these storm systems can cause expansive cloud cover, impacting conditions hundreds of miles away. The predictability of these systems is very low, as storm tracks are also beginning to vary as the seasons change. Storms approaching from the west can spread clouds across the eclipse path, thickening as the precipitation approaches. Another consideration with these storms is that winter weather can impact travel plans in the days leading up to the eclipse, even if day of is fair weather. On the thunderstorm front, sometimes they hold off until later in the afternoon, which could either help or hurt your eclipse viewing chances depending on where you are in the path. Generally, springtime thunderstorms are pretty localized events, but sometimes they spawn mid and high level clouds as well. Predicting the location and timing of storm initiation is also a bit touch and go, and they can generally be predicted pretty well, but their rapid formation can be a surprise if you're unprepared and not informed of the forecast. This image shows the climatology, or the 30-year average, of cloud cover on April 8th. The most noticeable takeaway from this climatology is that the cloud cover tends to increase with latitude, with more cloud cover the further north you are. Another factor that we might consider could be El Nino, which is a climate pattern that influences the weather in North America, will likely be transitioning out of this El Nino pattern beginning in April, but impacts to the US from this pattern often continue into the spring months. For the sake of being thorough, here's a quick look at the cloud climatology for the same time period, but for only El Nino years. Cloud coverage is higher nearly everywhere in this path, with the highest cloud cover still occurring in the higher latitudes. And here's some climatology statistics for different cities within the path of totality for the month of April. Temperatures everywhere are generally pretty mild, with average highs near 80 in Texas gradually decreasing along the path, with Ohio seeing average highs around 60. Snow is unusual south of Missouri or Illinois by the beginning of April, and precipitation days generally increase northward across the path. Climatology can be a helpful tool in long-term planning, but it becomes less and less useful as eclipse day approaches. Once you get to be around a week out from the eclipse, the forecast will be a more trustworthy estimation of conditions than a climatology will. Starting on the day before the eclipse, Satellite radar and other surface weather observations will be the best way to figure out what the cloud cover will be like at your location. One thing that is important to note, even if you're not in the path of totality, or if there's cloud cover obstructing your view, the darkness caused by a partial solar eclipse 
will still be noticeable even through clouds. For more information on the forecast leading up to the eclipse, check in with your local National Weather Service forecast office at weather.gov or on any of the social medias. For fun, I've included some satellite images here from April 8th of recent years, just for some context and to see what the cloud cover looked like within this year's eclipse path. 2017 here had mostly clear skies within the path with some high clouds further south, especially in Texas. 2018 had a large system overspreading the central U.S., with much of the U.S. besides central Texas and Ohio under a dense cloud deck. 2019 had most of the path under the outer fringes of clouds from a system in the southeast. 2020 had nearly all of the U.S. portion of the path, but then clear skies or mostly clear skies besides some thin high clouds. And finally, in 2021, a prominent cyclone was located over the Midwest, putting dense cloud cover over the central portion of the U.S. path. The areas near the edge of the cyclone, like Arkansas, have a sharp change in cloud cover, which shows how a few dozen miles can change conditions considerably. And with that, we're going to wrap the presentation up. I'll include some links in the description for some weather information, such as satellite imagery, in case you'd like to check them out. Thanks for watching, and best of luck eclipse chasing!